Right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Andrew Swiler, who is in lovely Barcelona in Spain. How are you doing, Andrew? <laughs> Thank you, John. It's good to be here. Very rarely am I jealous of where somebody lives, but I am jealous whenever I hear somebody is in San Diego because I do love it there. Yeah, yeah. And I was saying off air, St. Andrew, I, have, I did spend a year in living in Barcelona in the early 90s. So it's also not a shabby place to be at all. It's a, it's a beautiful place. And Andrew has been an entrepreneur for 10 years across software and e-commerce. He's a strategic entrepreneur and investor and currently the CEO of Lanteria, a leading HR software suite for Microsoft users. And it's interesting. So, Andrew, as we were talking just before, this is a company that, you know, you came in and acquired. Uh, and you, you, when you acquire, so, you know, you always kind of hope that it's intact and it's good and you can just build on top of it and you have great ideas to expand it. You maybe had a little a more common experience when all of those things are a little bit shattered and you sort of realize you have to, there's a lot of remediation or rebuilding or even blowing things up and starting over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I always tell people that, uh, people that acquire companies, I always let them know you're, you know, you got to know what you're buying. You're either buying the perfect company that is growing, has all the metrics, everything's working well for you. But in those cases, you're going to be paying a premium for mm -hmm. that company. And in our case, we knew based on the multiple that we were paying, that we were buying what's essentially a turnaround. I mean, the company had been flat in sales. The company had been doing relatively well. I mean, it was profitable, had been doing well. But when you're flat in software, you know that uh, something's wrong and yep. some big changes need to be made, especially when you go almost half a decade where sales just kind of stayed steady. And when we stepped in, especially on the sales side, what we noticed was that the, I mean, just to give an example, the sales team had no objectives. So they didn't even have KPIs. They didn't have anything. One of the guys in our one of our first meetings, we had to explain to him what ARR meant. Mm -hmm. And that was... <laughs> That was like when I sat there, I was like, all right, how are we do this? So I, we tried to work with them because we do have a very complex product. We have a product mm -hmm. that needs a lot of implementation, needs a lot of um, handholding in the sales process. And we have complex sales processes because we're selling to mid-market and enterprise. So you do need to have a lot of knowledge of our product. And we tried to make sure that our sales team was you know, up to snuff in you know modern sales tactics, but we just realized like, you know, no amount of information that these guys have is worth kind of putting up with what they're doing. Like they were right. just farming the current user base for revenue and they weren't bringing in anything new. And whenever we'd say to them like, okay, so let's start doing some outbound tactics. Right. Let's start using Apollo. Let's start, you know, pushing something that that's growing our top line. Cause they, they just expected that marketing going to throw some demos over the foot, over the fence to me. I'm going to run those demos. I'll run the process. I'll close the deal. And the market's changed over the last, you know, three to four years, especially in HR. It's very competitive. Yeah. And they didn't want to change. They didn't want to adapt to that uh, new reality. And that's when we knew we had to we had to kind of move on, blow things up and right. start start anew. So one, one interesting question. So, I mean, I presume there was probably some kind of existing sales process in place uh, and when had that been put in place and was it even enforced? Was it reviewed? Has Had it been uh, looked at in, in, in many years? Because that's a typical thing that you find. You go, okay, let's look at what's the sale process. Oh, yeah, yeah, we have one. And then you, when was the last time you updated it? Well, I don't know, a few years ago. How well do you follow it? Well, we don't really. Yeah, there. I wouldn't call it a process. I would call it that each person had their own way that they like to sell things. <laughs> Um, even down to the point where when we started automating some of the inbound marketing emails, so we would say, you know, let's, let's even just reviewing the process of, you know, when an inbound lead comes in, what do you guys do? What is the process? And our marketing said, okay, we have this set up, we have this drip marketing campaign, or we have this sort of inbound marketing campaign. And then if it doesn't work out, we send them to drip marketing. And what we found out is like one of the account executives was just sending his own emails at the same time. So <laughs> Somebody would re re receive two emails, like could could receive them two emails in, in 10 minutes. One's an automated email mm -hmm. and the other one wasn't. 
And when then when we reviewed, we're like, okay, maybe he has this personal touch. When we reviewed it, he was sending people like a book, basically, about the product. And it's like you just want to get people on a demo, like, yeah. or get them into a discovery call. It was it was like somebody's interested, and I'm going to send them a book yeah. and see if they read it. <laughs> and so when we tried to change that, he was he was receptive. He was yeah. amenable to it, and he let us kind of set things up. We set things up in Apollo. Um, tried to get, you know, a new sort of mm -hmm. inbound sequence going. And then he just would complain about the, se the sequence wasn't bringing enough lead. The leads were, you know, dying off. It wasn't, they weren't turning into demos. So we said, okay, here's the copy. And you send the emails at the cadence that you want to. Mm -hmm. Then we find out he's not even sending the emails. Yeah. He was just sending that first email. And then he would send things like, hey, do you want to book a demo? Do you want to book a demo? <laughs> then it went even further <laughs> that I had a friend of mine that's like a CRO step in and kind of do... Um, secret shopping for us. But right. He did a little bit of consulting and some secret shopping. And he does uh, secret shopping with a couple of our guys. And he calls me afterwards and he's like, I, I, I've i never even seen anything like this. He's like, I, I don't even know what to tell you. This was like three months after we mm -hmm. acquired the company. He's like, they didn't ask me a question in uh -huh. a discovery call. Zero questions. He said, you got to He's like, I don't even know if there's something that's salvageable here. I would just start over if I were you. Right, right, right. And that was a rude awakening. Yeah, no, no, for for sure. But it's it's it is it is super interesting the way uh, that I think personally I think that whole inbound thing ruined a lot of people because yeah. they started they started to believe the hype. And sure, it does in, inbound has its place absolutely, just as outbound has its place. But this idea that you could just kind of sit back and wait for all this stuff to come flooding in, uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of people fell for that. I agree, and. You know, what What we try to do to meet in the middle with these guys, yeah. because I, I, I actually, uh, I strongly agree with you. I think uh, what I was encouraging them to do was I said the first email in our inbound sequence is a personalized email. So we set it up in Apollo where the first email was a manual email mm -hmm. that they would have to go. The, the first email would say, hey, thank you. Somebody will be in touch with you. If, an e if, if uh, a lead came in, the first thing they had to do was call. If the person picked up the phone, then then talk to them. The next thing was send a personalized email, research the company, send them a case study of a similar company we had in our case study library, explain, you know, in the email how we help that company. And that was sort of like the next step. And then after that, if that didn't work, it would just start the, the follow ups that were more automated. Um, but at the same time, I told them if this is a company that's, you know, a, that really fits our niche and really fits our target, we can shut off the. Uh, Apollo, because our, our lead generation wasn't that strong mm -hmm. at the time. It's not like we were right. inundated with leads and we needed to run uh, these automations. The automation was more to make sure that these guys were actually following up more than <laughs> more than the quality of the automation. But I, I totally agree. I think there there needs to be highly personalized. Just because somebody said like, "Hey, yeah. I'm interested," usually people just want a price. They don't even want a demo. Yeah, yeah. And and you got to be willing to go that extra mile, yeah. push them. And show that you're a real company and not just, you know, an automated sequence that's going to bother them. Yeah. So, um, so then, how did you start to turn things around? I mean, as you said, I mean, you did the CRO did some uh, secret shopping and found that they weren't asking questions, they weren't in discovery. How did you turn that around? Because I mean, I think you know, success today in sales, especially in 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 complex sales and and B two B sales, is curiosity has to be the root of it. You have to be curious about the business of business and the business of your of your prospect yeah i think th there's actually a lot of uh similarities between just entrepreneurs in general yeah. and and salespeople. like i think entrepreneurs need to be salespeople mm -hmm. first and foremost and i always tell like people that want to become entrepreneurs i always tell them exactly that i say curiosity is the number one thing because you're going to get bored with this job and you're going to get bored with this industry and you always are going to have to find things that yeah. kind of push you. Yeah. And it could be just the curiosity of like, hey, look at this industry that just reached out to me. I'm going to do some research on how they do HR, how, what might be the specifics of it and see if I can kind of blow their socks off mm -hmm. by showing them that, you know, I did some research and I went beyond just like, hey, uh, thanks for signing up. Let's get on a demo. So I totally agree. And I think sales has to be that. And when you get on the call, you have to be like, wow, I'm you're, you're interviewing the person just trying yeah. to get the information finding what their problems are and then seeing if you might be able to solve it because you know in the end it's your product that's going to solve it but the salesperson yeah. is is really that point of contact that's going to solve it so i totally agree that the the curiosity needs to be there uh what did we do 
So, I mean, as I said to you off offline, we basically blew everything up. We kept one guy um, who was um, had been with the company about 10 years. Um, the, the other sales guys had been there for seven mm-hmm. or eight years. We kept a guy that had been there for 10 years. He's based in Europe. He knew the product very well. Um, we, we, he's, he's still on our team. He was somebody that was very dedicated. He's one of those guys that would answer emails from like 6 a.m. to midnight. <laughs> like, didn't matter what you needed. He was always on it. He was always willing to do the extra mile, always willing to you know send the invoices, always willing to do the kind of crappy work that no one else wants to do. And I said, all right, let's give this guy the benefit of the doubt. He's not our best sales guy, but he could be a great asset you know, mm-hmm. as we train up other people and he, know, he knows the product. So the first thing we did is we just kind of blew up let everyone go. Uh, I did what you mentioned at the top. I, I worked with a, uh, a guy that I met that we put together a sales playbook. Yep. Um, we kind of like dug deep into what we do, what's kind of the process. We showed, you know, what do we, you know, when does a lead get into Salesforce? When does it get turned into a uh, MQL, SQL opportunity? Kind of what, what are the what are the first steps there? What is the steps for emailing? Uh, it's still a work in progress. I mean, I mm-hmm. just this week sure. I'm working a lot on our inbound email sequence and outbound email sequence with uh, with a guy to to improve. Um, and then we went out after about a month of blowing up the team, and we just had one guy kind of taking all the leads. Mm-hmm. Uh, we went out and found an SDR. Uh, he didn't work out, but we you know gave it our best shot, and it was a good kind of learning experience. We went out and hired a couple more AEs. One of the AEs uh, was based in Canada. And about a month into working with us or six weeks in, I got a call from another CEO that reached out to me and he said, hey, um, does this guy work for you? And I said, yeah, he works for us. And he goes, that's strange because he just started working for me too, like three or four weeks ago. And he doesn't show up to meetings, doesn't perform. And it's a complete disaster. And I was like, oh, that's strange. He's actually kind of performing pretty well for us, but... Uh, I'll have a conversation with him. So, so, like the typical, like the, the overemployment thing, talk to the guy. And I said to him, I said, honestly, if you would come to me when we hired you and said, Hey, I'm probably going to get another job because of the compensation package, you know, until I get ramped up, we're run long enterprise right. sales cycles. So I'd say, I get it. Take two jobs. That's fine with me. But he didn't tell me that. And so I told him, you know, yeah. just because of the lack of honesty yeah. and we need, you know, we're a small company. We need pure honesty wherever we are. <laughs> and he tried to tell me I'm trying to feed my family, et cetera, et cetera. And I, he doesn't have a fa He just was, he had a dog <laughs> and, his, and his girlfriend. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, no, that doesn't work as well when you don't have a family. Like I have a family. So yeah. if I, <laughs> I can't that excuse, but that's, yeah. So that's, it's that's been a roller coaster. Weird. Yeah, that's hilarious. I remember one time years and years ago that so I, I, I came across a similar circumstance, not under me, but somebody who hired somebody for a position. They came, started for two weeks, and then after two weeks, they said, uh, no, I don't like this job. And it turns out they had just taken two weeks <laughs> vacation from their other job, and they just went back to it. But here's here's an interesting thing, though, and I think this is something that is shared across the board. I have never ever heard anybody say hiring say hiring great salespeople is easy. It's it's no. one of the hardest things. So how how have you gone about number one, what traits are you looking for now that you've gone through all of this? What are you looking for in an AE? So there's actually one trait that like the my number one filter in an AE is have you held a job in one company for more than three years. Mm-hmm. That for me is the number one uh, thing within the past decade. Yeah. yeah so yeah. That, that for me <laughs> is from, from hiring salespeople, what blows me away about this profession, I, I've seen it with, with developers as well. Developers sure. job hop, they get you know better offers. But developers, you know, their salary is just tied to their output or their, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, their salary is tied sort of to like the hours that they're yeah. going to, they're going to put in typically. In sales, you need to put in time and effort and and you know months or years to actually build up a pipeline. And what is just blows my mind is the amount of people that send me resumes that have held zero jobs in the mm-hmm. last decade for over 18 months. And how they keep getting hired is very confusing to me. But on top of that, you say, what is and some of them I've even talked to because I'm just curious. I'm a I'm a curious person mm-hmm. and I'll interview them and I'll say, what is the reason for all this? And they're like, 
oh, they keep moving our quotas around. You know, this guy, I had a terrible manager here. And I said, okay, that works like two or three times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you've done this nine times, <laughs> that's on you. Like you're, <laughs> you and and you're just jumping quota to quota. Like you're just trying to collect that base and yeah. jump over. And I think we're in an industry where, you know, if you go to real estate, most people that start these types of jobs, they're on a draw. They yeah. don't get a base salary. Yeah. Yeah. But for some reason, we've just decided to all agree that like, hey, we need salespeople because VC money comes in or whatever. We need salespeople. We're just going to pay on base. And yeah. I, I frankly think that it, it's kind of crazy, it, in it, my opinion. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, it's funny. It's interesting. I mean, the whole concept of the draw seems to have gone away. I mean, that used to be common. Totally. <laughs> And it, and it seems to have totally gone away. Uh, but I, I just want to come back to one thing you said earlier, because we would agree completely philosophically with you. Um, the founder of, of Pipeliner, Nicholas Kimler, he he coined the phrase salespreneurs because he said salespeople are the entrepreneurs in an enterprise. They're the only ones who have normally who have variable, sometimes no, right? Sometimes it's all commission, yeah. but variable. And therefore, they have, the they have to have an entrepreneurial approach to their book of business. Yeah, they do. And they're, they're the face of the business. I mean, I, I think mm -hmm. we've moved to a point where, you know, if you're looking at account-based marketing, I, yeah. I'm speaking specifically from, you know, enterprise or mid-market yeah. or, you know, anything like that. A lot of account-based marketing, which, you know, some people probably, it's a misnomer. They're calling account-based marketing. It's really just hyper-targeted uh, <laughs> marketing. But real account-based marketing is somebody is going to be the face. The SDR is the face. I mean, we've we've had SDRs that go out and they'll find people and bring them to webinars and call them and, you know, build a relationship just to get them to come to a webinar and watch us talk about something. And they're the face of it. And, you know, you see like on their LinkedIn, they make sure you got to make sure they have the banner. Yeah. You make sure that they, they're, they're, you know, clearly putting that out there that a developer wouldn't have that. They're not going to say I work at Lanteria and I'm, you know, solving HR, uh, HR solutions. Mm -hmm. th th that's what the entrepreneur, the CEO and the sales team is going to do. And they are the face and they, they have to be, you know, curious. And, and the market, like I said, is, is constantly changing. Like a lot of people are used to where we were in 2015, 2016. Yeah. A lot of people on our team are or were uh, where it was just way easier. I mean, you were fishing with dynamite that you were the <laughs> only thing. And and people just had no there was like, I'm on an Excel sheet and I need to do something. My boss is telling me we can't be on Excel anymore. Yeah. And they would come to you and you'd get the deal done pretty quickly just on price. But now, I mean, it's yeah. every category is packed. Yeah, it, it is. And and that's why, I mean, it's, it's a kind of a good news, bad news thing. Because the good news is if you are a good salesperson, if you care about your craft, if you want to learn, if yeah. you're curious, if you want to move with the times and you, know, you want to keep the, the best of the past and adopt the best of the present and the future, the bar is set pretty low for you right now. So you can stand out yeah. pretty darn quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like I said, have you held a job for more than three years, which I think is even a pretty low barrier in mm -hmm. itself. But I found that if I go higher than that, I'm probably not going to interview very many people. Right. <laughs> it's not what I've seen. But yeah, I mean, you, you need to be and, and what I love is when people will come to me that have studied our market. I mean, some people, you know, we're interviewing people that that are in the market and they know the market very well and they can speak to pretty much everything. But people that aren't in the market, I'm always impressed when somebody in any role in sales or marketing comes to me with a presentation and a plan mm -hmm. of what they're going to do. And that that plan could be total fluff. It could be just something that, you know, they made with ChatGPT, but it's yeah. like you said, the bar is so low that just doing that puts you at least face to face with me, which is uh, yeah. you know, uh, way further than anyone else is getting when I'm just looking at, you know, that how many years they worked somewhere. Yeah. So it's, it's really interesting. I, I do also look, I, I do try to hire um, more women. I really? think we are frankly understaffed in sales with, with women and, yeah. and some of the women that I've met and HR luckily it lends itself to that, but I like working with women. And I think in sales, they're honest, uh, mm -hmm. more honest than, <laughs> than men are most of the time. Yeah. And so that's another thing that I have been trying to look for is bringing more women, but it, it's really hard. There's not a lot. Um, yeah. No, that's from a percentage true. perspective. And I, and I would I would agree with you because they they I mean I've I've known some phenomenal um, salespeople women because they bring that level of empathy and also 
authenticity yeah. seems to they seem to be natural with authenticity whereas now we're having people saying oh you need to be more authentic how can i be more authentic well i'll teach yeah. you how and you're going no that doesn't quite work like that <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and a lot of times i mean if you talk to most salespeople, they're they're their one common trait is they're very competitive, usually yep. men or women. They're, they're mm -hmm. usually very competitive people, which is good. But a lot of times in men that can manifest itself in, uh, I would say, semi-toxic way mm -hmm. of doing things. And I mean, what, one of the guys we got rid of was the definition of toxic. He would yell at he would yell at people on the marketing team. He would get angry with people. He would treat me, he would have like this deference for me and speak to me in this like really false way <laughs> and then like turn around and like yell at someone on the same call and you'd be like, this is, it's not authentic. It's, and yeah. it just doesn't work and people can see it in sales. Like I would watch his demos and I'm like, this just sounds like a robot talking <laughs> to people. Like that's. That's not what people want to buy from. They want to buy yeah. from a human. They do, and 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 uh, yeah, and more so than ever now. I think uh, I think, but the, before the pandemic, things were starting to swing back a little bit, where people were saying, "No, I, I, yeah, I love all this automation and technology." I mean, we're a technology company and stuff, but I still I still want that human relationship. Then obviously we had the pandemic and people. So now, if you're not if you're not if you're not selling humanly, for want of a better word. Um, you know, you're not going to connect with people because their their antennas are up. So this is a weird thing. I saw. I was at a, and keep in mind this was from somebody from Facebook. So it might, mm -hmm. you know, they might be speaking their book. Mm -hmm. But um, they gave a statistic from I think McKinsey that eighty percent of software buyers do not want to speak to someone mm -hmm. before purchasing yeah. the software, which I found surprising. I mean, I guess coming from our like neck of the woods of sort of yeah. mid-market and enterprise. But I, I'm I'm interested to drill down into it more because I personally, as a software buyer, I actually am like that too. I'm like, just mm -hmm. you know, yeah. hook me up and let me <laughs> get started. But I, I guess it is, it depends on the type of software. Like there are softwares that are more complex and you need more implementation, you need more people, but mm -hmm. It's, it's always hard to square that circle. And I, and I think a part of that is, uh, you know, as we finish up, I think a part of that is that we've just had so many bad experiences that we're just like, I, yeah. I don't want to talk to you. Just give me this stuff. Yeah. Therefore, if you can get to talk to somebody and you can surprise them, with, yeah, with the interaction, they go, huh, that was actually a, that was actually that was worth my while talking to this person. Yeah. Then yeah. again, <laughs> again, you're head and shoulders above other people. Yeah, absolutely. No, so anyway, I think about a lot. Yeah, so this has been great. Uh, all of Andrew's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and Lanteria. So Lanteria is, uh, like you said at the top, Lanteria is an HR management software. We compete with you know Workday, uh, mm -hmm. Namely, Bamboo HR. Uh, it's Hire to Retire. We have LMS. We basically have the whole suite uh, inside of Lanteria, but we focus on Microsoft users. So we've built our product uh, inside of SharePoint, inside of Microsoft right. Office 365, and with you know great Teams integration. So it's it's set up for companies that want to be in Microsoft all day, want that compliance, want that security, want that safety. Um, and it's a great company. We've been growing 40% uh, since we've taken over and always looking for new great companies to come uh, join our ranks as, in, as clients. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I encourage you to go go check it out, and congratulations on your phenomenal growth. That uh, you know, given the given the past few years, that's uh, that's pretty dramatic growth. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, listen. Thanks again, Andrew. Thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Yeah.